First of all, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to this, uh, what promised to be a very interesting uh, talk on the reduction of the global impact of infectious disease through vaccination. Um, we are offering simultaneous translation, so you can pick up a headset. English is on channel one, et le français est sur le canal deux, uh, pour ceux qui uh, le veulent. Um, also, I would like to welcome our audience on the web. Uh, we are webcast live, I believe, and uh, we are also quite happy to be taking question at time of question period from the audience, and this audience is here in Ottawa, but also uh, virtually on the web. So let me please give you a few remarks to introduce to you a uh, very uh, distinguished guest uh, someone that really made a difference in the world and that has been acknowledged uh, by numbers of price in the recent past. It's Dr. Lauren Babiak, Vice President of Research at the University of Alberta. Lauren, welcome. Lauren is an internationally recognized leader in vaccine research. This year, he won one of the highest award in scientific merit in Canada the Killian Prize for his outstanding career achievement and advance in the health sciences. Not only did he won the 2013 Killian Prize last year, he was a recipient of the Canada Gardner Award, one of the most prestigious in the world. And just a few are given every year to biomedical scientists who make original contribution to understanding human biology and disease. He also held the Canadian, Canadian Research Chair from 2001 to 2007 and was named an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2005. And his knowledge and education have carried over to his current role as Vice President of Research, as I mentioned, at the University of Alberta. Today, Lauren is joining us to discuss his groundbreaking international research on reducing the global impact of infectious disease through vaccination. Infectious diseases are the single largest cause of financial losses in the agricultural sector worldwide. High level of ill health and mortality in livestock due to infectious disease also disrupt international trade and prevent food security. Livestock are one of the key assets of the poor, sometimes call the walking bank accounts. So the effects are great. Many infectious diseases move between animal and the people that care for them. So animal health can have a direct effect on human health as well, and we will touch on some of this in the talk. Now, Lorne, with his distinguished career, comes to IDRC also with the merit of having been selected through an internationally competitive process as one of the recipient of the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, which is called in short CIFSER, which is a program that is run jointly by IDRC and the FATB, the Department, for, Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. The CIFSERF program is a journey of $124 million allocated through competitive process and where it's moving essentially towards uh, backing up the Canada's food security strategy. It's funding support to apply research, apply research that is done in partnership between Canadian and developing region researcher and with the goal of finding lasting solution to hunger and food insecurity. These grants and these initiatives allows, allows for collaboration between the brightest mind here and abroad. And I was mentioning that Lorne had the merit of receiving one, but in fact it's two. Uh, it's quite an ex exceptional accomplishment in a competition that has received over 300 applications that he was able with the, his collaborator to manage two projects. And not only it was remarkable, but recently or last year, about this time, I was in Australia with the Australian Centre of Agri International Agricultural Research. Uh, 
And you know, in this journey, you commute between the research site and a bus. And I was with the uh, Director General of the International Livestock Research Institute, uh, Jimmy Smith, a Canadian. And I was asking Jimmy, Jimmy, talk to me about the thing that you are doing right now that really excites you. You know, what is the best thing that you're currently working on? And Jimmy says, oh, Jean, you know, I'm working on this vaccine development, a thermal-resistant vaccine. You know, this is so exciting. And he started to go on and on and on. And I said, but Jimmy, you know, we have a project of this nature with Lauren Babiak uh, in the University of Alberta. He says, well, this is the project I'm part of. <laughs> so this is the quality of the work and the kind of excitement that Lauren and his colleagues are generating. When you talk to the director general of an institution, he tells you this is the most exciting thing. And you come to know that it's us, Canadians, that are funding it. It's done in partnership between Canada and developing region, I think that's something we should be proud of. And this is the type of endeavor that Lauren has showed throughout his career. He has dedicated himself to developing technologies and finding solutions to infectious diseases of both animals and humans. For example, he helped to develop the vaccine and infection disease organization in Saskatoon, Vido a center internationally regarded for its work in developing veterinary vaccines. Early in his career, he worked on vaccination for rotavirus and calves, which was costing the cattle industry about $300 million annually. This technology was then used to develop a vaccine for children when about 500,000 children die annually from the virus. Uh, prior to the development of the vaccine. It is innovation like this that we as Canadians can be proud of. Today, as I mentioned, Dr. Babiak is working on a project that applies modern biotechnology to engineer a single-shot vaccine that protects cattle, sheep, and goats from five major diseases. The project is also hoping to produce the first commercial vaccine for African swine fever. By educating farmers in the use and effectiveness of these vaccine, vaccines, it can help to dramatically reduce economic losses to animals. I think that we are all excited, I hope, to hear from Lorne. I've said already enough. It's a great pleasure to call you to the podium, Lorne, and welcome you at IDRC. Thanks for giving us this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, not sure that I can sort of uh, meet that bar that you have uh, set. But uh, as you notice, uh, I changed my title just a little bit because I uh, knew Lauren Hepworth was here, so I had to put biotechnology into the to the talk. Uh, but uh, really, what I'd like to do is give you a little brief introduction of. Uh, why I am interested in uh, these types of vaccines. If you look at the, uh, at the world today, there's about a billion people that go to bed hungry every night. And I don't mean hungry like I did last night because my plane was late and so I didn't have time for dinner. It's day after day after day. Of course, you can say there's probably a billion of us that eat too much. Uh, but it shows that there is a huge issue in food uh, shortages. And if we predict that by 2050, we'll have another 2 billion mouths to feed, you can see the challenge that we have in food production uh, over the next uh, couple of decades. And the last time I checked, they were not making more land. So therefore, we're having actually decreased uh, uh, land resources because we're paving them over with, uh, with concrete and, and cities, et cetera. And with climate change, uh, we, are, we have an opportunity to either have a new approach to increase food or there are going to be more people that are going to be hungry. Uh, agriculture investments uh, seem to have declined a bit in 2000, but I think that we're trying to encourage people and more and more investments are starting to come forward because they're realizing that really we do have a need for food. 
increase in food prices uh, and a demand for more protein, especially in the developing world. The developing world is looking for more and more protein, and I think we in the developed world should not deny them that, uh, that right. Uh, as John said, uh, it's the, the bank. It is, livestock are really a critical component of cash income for, uh, for a large number of people. Uh, if we can raise the production of milk, meat, and fish, we're obviously going to be able to improve the welfare of uh, a large number of people. And the most important part, which I'm sure all of you here at IDRC are very much aware, that a lot of this food production is done by very small uh, holders, which support about 2 billion people. Uh, and again, the majority of these, about two-thirds two of these smallholder livestock keepers are women. So we need to, again, help them to be able to have a much better uh, uh, ability to produce food for the, for the families. And again, if an individual has, and I sort of use this example, if a family has three goats and one of them die, that's a third of their entire investment. I know in 2008, when you lost a third of your uh, stock portfolio, you didn't necessarily go hungry, but they actually go hungry. So technology, and that's for biotechnology, I think can actually be a savior. Uh, but again, it's a challenge because we have a large number of people that are anti-genetically modified organisms, uh, genetically modified food. So we have to balance the, and I think this is where we have a responsibility uh, to work with social scientists to ensure that we position these issues correctly. And my bottom line there is you have healthy animals, you'll have healthy food, you'll have healthy productive people. And more importantly, a lot of times we don't talk about that, economic stability. And we see economic instability in a lot of places where there are issues of, uh, of poverty and, uh, and less hope, let's put it that way. So I have spent my career in infectious diseases. And you'd say, why infectious diseases? And I put this slide up here because I started my career at a time when the Surgeon General of the United States said, it is time to close the book on infectious diseases. I was very fortunate. I was a farm kid, and I didn't read the New York Times. <laughs> Why would a person go into a career which a learned individual, as the Surgeon General of the United States says, this is done, over with. We have antibiotics. Well, I was going to say fortunately. Uh, fortunately for me, I guess. but. In 2000, actually 1999, the, not the same Surgeon General, a different one, <laughs> said, we are seeing a global resurgence in infectious diseases. And so my career has spanned the time when it was a career that you should never, ever go into to a place where, wow, it's a pretty good career. And you might say, why is he using old data? Because that's the time that the Surgeon General <laughs> uh, said that it's, it's back. So out of 40, 54 million uh, deaths annually, about a third of them were as a direct result of infectious diseases. But now we also know that there's a large number of cancers that are caused by infectious diseases. Uh, gastric cancer, helicobacter, human papillomavirus, cervical cancers, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. In fact, hepatitis C and hepatitis B are the major causes for liver transplants in those countries where we can afford them. And if you look at the economic aspects, uh, I mean, BSC in the UK costs about 2.5 billion direct compensation. In Canada, it's about a billion dollars. But if you ask the uh, Canadian and do the, the stats, it's about $8 billion in Canada. And I was talking to somebody the other day uh, in Alberta. Uh, they have still not recovered from the BSC. Foot and mouth disease, billions of dollars. SARS, a hundred billion dollars. And I use SARS, it's, a, it's an animal human disease. In Ontario alone, it costs about two billion dollars. You say, whoa, it's only 50 people were affected. Well, 
It's because of trade, everything else. And influenza, we have that annually, and then we have a whole series of emerging, new and emerging diseases. And I'm not a great mathematician, but I've worked out that we have 30 infectious or emerging or new diseases in the last 30 years. So that's about one a year. I can figure that math out. And we don't know what the next ones are going to be. And what's more important is about 70%, actually about 74% to be exact, 74.3, uh, are uh, zoonotic diseases. So that means they are transmitted from animals to humans. But I want to show you something that, in fact, it's not just transmitted from animals to humans. It's from, transmitted from humans back to animals. And I'll give you an example. H1N1, which happened a number of years ago, uh, we actually investigated a case, and this, this happened in Alberta, uh, where we had uh, a party on Friday night. Somebody had H1N1, was at the party. A whole bunch of people that were at that party uh, worked in, a, in our university research swine facility. That's when we knew it. we did it. <laughs> on Wednesday, so they came back to work on Monday. On Wednesday, the, cat, the pigs started coughing. We showed it was exactly the same virus from the humans to the pigs. So we always think it's the other way. In fact, it was always blamed as a swine, f swine fever, swine flu. Well, no, it wasn't swine flu. It was human flu went to swine. And so in zoonosis, economic consequences are huge to farms, to producers. As Jean talked about international trade. In fact, many of the, if we got foot and mouth disease here, it would kill very few. Well, BSE was a very good example. A dozen cows cost us $8 billion. Boy, those are pretty gold-plated cows. But it's because of trade. Price of food then instantly goes up in different places. In Canada, beef was very cheap, but that's the other consequence, and has impacts on human health. So I spent my career in vaccines because uh, in my opinion, vaccination is one of the most cost-effective approaches for managing infectious diseases. In fact, it's been stated that vaccination has saved more lives than all other therapies and prophylaxis combined. Now, that's quite a statement. Diseases have been eradicated. For example, smallpox used to kill 2 million people every single year. Cost us $300 million globally to eradicate it. Here was a perfect example of cooperation by nations to eradicate a disease. Today, it is estimated that the return on investment occurs every 90 days. What a fantastic investment. Render pests. That's the only other animal disease that was. And it, again, this was a huge trade issue, but also it happened in, in uh, parts of the world where developing world. And here's an example of early 1980s. The countries, doesn't, doesn't come out as well. Looks better on there. <laughs> but you can see the uh, orangey part, how extensive it was through the world. Following the introduction of vaccine, you can see quickly by the 1990s, by 2001, there was just a few little pockets. By 2007, the last site was under investigation. It is eradicated. Huge, huge implications for society. So how did we do that? We did it mostly by conventional vaccines, either live vaccines or killed vaccines. Those were the ones that were the vaccines that most of the human and animal vaccines are. However, there's been some really, really interesting opportunities with developing new technologies in the last 15 years and developing subunit vaccines, gene-deleted vaccines, or vectored vaccines. So I'll spend the rest of the time talking about those. Uh, and we have developed a, whenever you do a killed vaccine, you have to incorporate it with some adjuvants or some things that will stimulate the immune response. And we have found a very, very effective compound called polyphosphacines. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, it's uh, there's about 700 patents on it for tires. Good year and all those other. But this compound is fantastic. 
It can make microspheres, it can be soluble, you can do whatever you want with it, uh, and gives you extremely long-lasting immunity. So we've actually tested it with existing vaccines. We didn't have to do anything magical about it. And if you look, uh, the uh, this is the immune response to the regular commercial influenza vaccine. This one, this one, and this one. If you add polyphosphacine to it, you can see the dramatic enhancement of immune responses. I can't see that slide, I can't, but it's the big ones are the ones with polyphosphacy. You can see dramatic increases. The other one is hepatitis B, which is a subunit genetically modified or genetically produced vaccine. Uh, this is what you get with a commercial vaccine. Just go to the pharmacy and get the uh, hepatitis B vaccine. You immunize an individual, by one week there's no immune responses, by two weeks there's a little bit of response. You don't boost it, that's why you have to give three different shots. It's decreased, you don't do it. With polyphosphacine, you can see, and there's two different forms of it. You, we can, it's, a, it's an interesting molecule, it can change side chains, and you can see how fast it is. This is a log scale, hundreds of times better. With a single dose, it gives you really long-lasting immunity. And what's even more important is if we look at the immune response at different doses of the vaccine, uh, you can see this is what the normal vaccine is. So you can get, this is with the, just alum, as it gets, you get it from the pharmacy. If you add polyphosphacine, you get increased responses. If you decrease the dose to 0.2 from one microgram, you don't get any more response with the commercial vaccine, but you do with the uh, adjuvanted vaccine. And you can even decrease it to 0.04 and still get as good an immune response as you did. So this has huge implications for the developing world and also for the developed world. You remember when H1N1 came around, we couldn't produce enough vaccine. So we could maybe immunize a million people. Well, if you could decrease the dose tenfold, you could right away immunize 10 million people. That is the implications for it. So I wanna talk now about a little bit more about influenza virus. Uh, currently, influenza vaccines, they're killed or subunit vaccines. Uh, they induce systemic antibodies, just antibodies through, to, but, and it gives you narrow protection. That's why you always see, well, maybe we didn't get exact match year to year. Well, what we've been able to do is we've been able to develop a vaccine which actually is a live vaccine, which is quite unique. A billion pigs are infected annually and the virus is a unique virus because it has these spikes sticking out of it called hemagglutinin. And the hemagglutinin is what is used to attach the cell and get into the cell and cause infection. Now that hemagglutinin must be cleaved by an enzyme, trypsin, in your respiratory tract. So when it affects your mucosal surfaces, it then, the enzymes in your respiratory tract cleave it, it's infectious. If you don't cleave it, it's not infectious. So we were able to change the cleavage site from trypsin to elastase. We don't have elastase in our nose. So you can grow it in culture, develop this beautiful vaccine, deliver it, it replicates, but can't spread. And so we can vaccinate animals and induce a broad spectrum response. So here's an example. Uh, again, if you look, uh, these are two different mutants. If you use elastase, each of these little holes shows that the virus is replicating and growing. Uh, if you do it with trypsin, it doesn't. If you do nothing, it doesn't either. So, and you can see they grow exactly the same as the wild type virus, just changing three amino acids. And if you then go and immunize animals, you can see that after a single dose, you get an immune response. A second dose, you get a boost. Two different mutants. Obviously, those animals that weren't immunized didn't get an immune response. What's more important is look at the disease in the lungs. These are lesions. These are all individual animals. You can see if they were challenged with the H1N1 vaccine, uh, there's a lot of lesions. Those are vaccinated, no lesions. And this is uh, the homologous. This is the heterologous, but still H1N1. And this is a totally different influenza, which is H3N2. You can still see significant protection. And in fact, if you look at virus, shedding, you can see there's a number of animals that are actually sterile. These are all 100% uh, 
protected. These are partially protected. So you can see a broadening of the immune response. So that's, again, another trick that we can use to be able to grow the virus in culture and give a broad uh, immune response. So coming to the IDRC uh, program, the objective is to use all the knowledge we had before to develop a single-shot vaccine to protect against multiple diseases. And again, in the developing world, it's not easy to be able to have the virus in a cold chain for hours and days even. So we want a thermostable vaccine for use in developing countries. And also, then, once you have, have the vaccine, you need to educate the, the population and the communities and the smallholder uh, communities and I told you that most of them were women as well, we need to be able to develop educational systems to make sure that we can deliver them the appropriate way. And therefore, this will reduce economic losses to the animal, which have animals have huge implications. We have tractors, they have draft animals. Uh, these animals will, will grow better, produce better milk, trade, uh, et cetera. So the four diseases, uh, that we've been looking at. In fact, we have five diseases, but I'll just show you four. It's lumpy skin disease, mostly in Africa. Rift Valley fever, Africa as well. Sheep and goat pox, you can see broad areas, and pestis de petite ruminants. So what we said is, okay, uh, let's look at Rift Valley fever. It's a disease which many of you probably have never heard of. Uh, as virologists, we're extremely talented in how we name our viruses or infections, you know. <laughs> Wherever we find it, we call it that. So it, uh, it causes tremendous disease, inaptance, nasal, bloody diarrhea, uh, 90 to 100 percent of animals that are pregnant abort. Uh, there's uh, huge mortality, especially in the young, but also in the, in the old. Uh, it's transmitted by insect vectors. Uh, and the host range is actually quite broad. And this is, again, another zoonotic disease. And I have some huge concerns, personal concerns, about this virus coming to North America or Western Europe. We say, oh, no, it's been in, in Africa for years. Well, West Nile, another well-named virus, uh, arrived. And you know what happened. We didn't have West Nile for years. But it's the same type of vector, same process, et cetera. So why would Rift Valley not come here? So theoretically, yes, we are helping the developing world. But there might also be some selfish uh, needs for the Canadian and North American and Western Europe area. And that's, again, another reason for being able to invest in these types of products. So this is the consequences. They get infected, large percentage of them die. Another disease is pestis de petite ruminants. Again, it's another very infectious disease. You don't have to go through all of the uh, biology of it. Again, transmitted uh, from animal to animal very easily. Very easy to spread uh, by animal movement. And again, the host range here is mostly sheep and goats, small ruminants. Uh, again, all kinds of pathology, little petite you know, hemorrhages. And then lumpy skin disease. This is another disease that has huge implications, not only for mortality, but also the hide, hides of animals. Uh, it's, so what we've said, OK, lumpy skin disease is a pox virus. Very, very stable. In fact, years ago, if you probably remember, uh, you know, biological warfare was, uh, was practiced without telling people what it was. I mean, people would. Uh, uh, give blankets with smallpox to, uh, to different people, and they would then get uh, infected. So uh, that was bioterrorism, I guess, not, never called that. But it's because this virus is so stable, it'll sit there in scabs for years. So if we can use this virus as a very stable virus, as the vector, we can not only protect animals against the disease, lumpy skin disease, but also against other genes that are put into this particular disease. So what we've done is we've created a gene deletion which attenuates the virus. And I'll actually show you some slides how it's been attenuated. We've tested it in sheep, and we've tested it in goats now. So it is actually very good, prevents a disease in both of these species, which is the major disease-causing organism, 
uh, for these diseases. Then we've used these deletions to insert genes or are using it. This is exactly what the, the grant is. The first part of it is to develop the platform. We've done that already. Now we're putting the genes into these particular sites and then we'll hopefully be able to uh, demonstrate that this vaccine doesn't only protect against lumpy skin disease, but against Rift Valley fever, against Pestis Petites ruminans. So now you can add all the other genes that we want to and test the immune response following challenge. That's really what the strategy is. So how do you do this? We have very, very fine scissors that can just go and cut out a specific gene, but it's not quite as simple as that. You have to know which gene to cut out and which one is going to cripple the virus, et cetera. But we have the technology. Uh, and here's an example. We cut out the gene of lumpy skin disease. And on the, where are you? You're on, the, on your left, you can see the animal that was challenged with the, uh, with the lumpy skin disease. You can see the pox all there. This is an animal that was vaccinated. Nothing. Completely protected. But then we don't only have fancy scissors, we have crazy glue, and we can go and insert genes in and, and stitch them in there. And so now this virus can protect against not only the lumpy skin disease, but whatever you put into it. And so that's what, again, in a simplified manner, that's the whole genome, and then you just put the, uh, the cassettes in, and away it goes. And so that's the theory we've done it with uh, vaccine virus, so now we're doing it with uh, lumpy skin disease. So we know that we can do that. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, what we have done is we've created a gene-deleted attenuated virus. We know it's attenuated. We know it's thermostable now. Uh, we've inserted genes into the virus, but we're inserting the new genes now into the virus uh, and is going to be tested in against protection against multiple diseases and then identifying a path to the market. And again, this is the whole issue that that's the next big step. You can have the vaccine, but you now have to introduce it into the developing world. You have to introduce it through the marketing systems. And that's where we're now in the process of developing additional things. So you say, you're not just a genetic engineer, you're also a social engineer to be able to engineer the, the delivery to the, to the place where it's going to be. And again, our goal is to protect animals and improve economic livestock production. And again, we hope that by doing this, we'll have a healthier and more prosperous society. And again, if you want to look at it, because some people say, why do we have to do this? And I say, but if you have a healthy, prosperous society, it will improve outside. It'll improve our trade as well. And so it gives a whole global improvement on, on economics. And again, that gives you much stable uh, economic uh, development as well. So with that, I gave you a broad overview of the types of things that we're doing, types of things that excite me. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Babiak, uh, Professor Babiak. Is it on? Yeah. It is now, okay. Seems to be working. Turned up. OK. Um, you, you began with uh, rotavirus, uh, pertussis, uh, SARS, uh, now Rift Valley fever, lumpy skin pox. Um, any one of these will take decades uh, to uh, define the the, the, the critical proteins to uh, uh, do uh, uh, all of the um, uh, uh, insertions to uh, develop um, uh, actual uh, uh, clinical tests. How did you decide that this was something that you were willing to take on as a young scholar? Uh, I'm thinking of, of a time frame that, that might be a, a person's lifetime for a single one of these. Uh, to actually see change. How did you see it when you were a young scholar? I guess I was, well, I shouldn't say I was stupid at that time. I'm still <laughs> stupid, but uh, uh, to me, time didn't seem to be uh, a consideration. I mean, you do what you thought you could do. Uh, I mean, with rotavirus, I mean, it was, and a lot of this is serendipitous. I mean, I'll give you a little story of how we got into rotavirus. Uh, I happened to be on a committee of a 
of a PhD student. Uh, and one day, I just arrived in Saskatoon, uh, and he was doing his PhD in Rotovars. In my naivety, I said, well, how can you do a PhD if you can't grow the virus? I mean, you've got to be able to grow it. We said, well, we can't grow it. Nobody can grow it. So I knew nothing about rotavirus. And then I said, okay, wow, what, what can I do to make it grow? And again, this is, in fact, I have some concerns today about how we train our students. They don't train, train them in biology very well, broad biology. It's very narrow molecular biology. So I said, well, what's unique where rotavirus grows? What's in the gut? There's all kinds of enzymes, prolytic enzymes. Uh, so I said, uh, okay, we put it in culture. And we knew we could put it in culture, and it would grow through one cycle, and that would be it. It would stop. So well, what if we put some prolytic enzymes in the culture? And again, it cleaved the protein. So I mean, these are things that now we know. We cleave proteins. We grow the virus like crazy. So that allowed us to do, develop a vaccine against it. So you sort of do things naively, naively, sometimes serendipitously, and away it, it goes. Uh, but again, I never, I guess as I said, I was naive. I never worked for commercial companies. I didn't know how, mu how much it cost <laughs> to develop a vaccine and how long it took to develop a vaccine. I've learned a little bit now, so I know a little yeah. bit more about it. Yeah. Now, would you say, just on this question of time, that there has been a, a relatively dramatic transformation in uh, the length of the cycle from uh, 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 new ideas about uh, uh, growing uh, in culture to an actual uh, marketable uh, commercial product? Well, the answer is yes and no. The yes part of it is, for example, the ones that we have here, uh, we don't take, think, well, well, I'm confident. In fact, I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't be around 20 years from now to, uh, <laughs> to do it, even though. Uh, but uh, we know the antigens. We know the genes. We have the ability to pull the genes out and put them in. Uh, you know, it took us uh, 18 months to uh, take the uh, lumpy skin disease, identify the particular genes, delete the genes. You know, 20 years ago, that would have not been possible. So we have the technologies. We can do it much faster. We know which genes to insert in. So again, the issue is, I think that the, the technology part of it to develop the, the platform and the vaccine is much shorter time frame. The, where I said the no part of it is, is now the introduction. And uh, it's actually harder now to introduce uh, vaccines because we are so risk averse. Uh, Anti-GMOs, etc. I told you that we eradicated smallpox with a vaccine that would not be licensed today, mm -hmm. would never be licensed today, because it has too many side effects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the issue is, so the yes part of it, technology, the no part of it is still the social aspects and all these other aspects. So, but again, we're hopefully getting smarter of how to engage the social science and the in a social innovation people early on. The social licensing part of this. Um, let's talk about the path to market. You, you brought this up uh, at the close. You tantalized us with what might be some of the challenges. You're now uh, a senior research administrator with uh, an encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, of uh, commercial uh, uh, processes uh, to market. What would you see in an African context are the major uh, obstacles uh, in these pathways to scale? Well, the major obstacle is uh, getting a commercial company that uh, is willing to invest in the regulatory component uh, because uh, there isn't as big a financial return as if you develop, I mean, the hepatitis B vaccine sells for $70 a dose, free doses. That's $210. There is no way you would sell a vaccine for $200. And a livestock vac vaccine is in the 50 cent dose. 
so that's the challenge, is how do we get, uh, and so that's why we have to work with uh, hopefully uh, African uh, production companies that are willing to, or, or Indian companies. I mean, hepat using hepatitis B again. Uh, the uh, Serum Institute of India produces hepatitis B vaccine for 39 cents a dose. Mm. So now they can immunize the Indian uh, subcontinent. Indeed. So um, we, do, we do that. So, and again, the beauty of it is now, years ago, you could not uh, test vaccines in the developing world if you hadn't already tested it in the developed world mm. because that was the, the exploitation part. Whereas now, uh, we're... Many of these countries, especially in the human area, have regulatory processes, so you can actually do a, uh, a vaccine test in the developing country. In fact, I wrote an article about uh, first in humans in the developing world. We need to do that because a lot of people don't, don't realize that, is the microbiome has a huge impact on how you respond to uh, infections and to vaccination. And we found that out with oral polio. Totally different responses in the developing world because their microbiome, they have parasites, they have all kinds of other things that are, that are different. So we have to do them in the developing world, in the environment where they're going to be used. And so I think that some people are starting to, or regular people are starting to recognize that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to have been part of that. Indeed. And it's a, a huge debate in places like India um, uh, and South Africa around these issues of uh, uh, clinical testing and uh, um, uh, ethical standards and, and, and so on, uh, a challenge that we're uh, well engaged with. Um, I wonder if you would uh, um, uh, tell us something about uh, uh, your own um, uh, uh, efforts to uh, start the vaccine and infectious disease organ, uh, organization in Saskatchewan? Well, I personally did not start it. Dr. Chris Bigland was the uh, vision behind it. Uh, it was uh, uh, so, but when he uh, retired, we put together a different uh, philosophy. In fact, we actually changed, started out as a veterinary infectious disease organization. When I became the director, I actually uh, kept the acronym of VITO, but I called it the Vaccine Infectious Disease Organization. Again, because of the uh, zoonotic and implications between humans and animals. And, uh, you know, it, it was interesting. Uh, Chris had a tremendous vision. Uh, and it was situated in the University of Saskatchewan as a separate entity, and we thought, well, this is going to be great because we can uh, do commercial, industrial activities, and we can do academic activities. And I'm a firm believer that you have to do those. There's none, I, I don't believe that there's basic research and applied research. I mean, the two of them just have to work together. In fact, applied research pulls the basic, and the basic pushes the applied. So he said, well, we can go to uh, NSERC, for example, and, uh, and get university-based funding to do the basic stuff. And we can go to IRAP and all the industry candidate programs to get uh, industry types of grants. Surprise, surprise. When we went to the academic granting agency, they said, oh, no, no, you're too industry-oriented. So you don't follow this. Get level. commercial money for that. So we went to the commercial part. They said, oh, no, no, you're too academic. <laughs> so rather than being, being smart and <laughs> ride both horses, we ended up falling between the horses. But fortunately, we persisted, and I was, I, I'm proud to say, I was the first chair, NSERC chair, industrial research chair in biotechnology in the country. Mm. And that sort of broke the, the logjam. Did, did you ever think that this would become uh, an internationally recognized center of excellence? Was, that may have yeah. been the vision, but did you ever yeah. see it as a reality? It's it's an interesting question. Uh, the goal was to be the best we could. We never ever said we've got to be international. We've got to do this. I never started out that I. In fact, I didn't even know about the Gardner Foundation. You don't go out and say, "I'm going to get the Gardner Award." You know, you don't do that. 
And I'm not sure that I was that smart to be able to see the entire... I mean, the vision was to be the best... You don't best get the same CVs that I see. I mean, I see people who write on their CVs that they were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> well, you can be nominated, but, but it's, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Even, even, if I got, even if I was nominated or got the... I mean, I still get up in the morning, put one leg into a pant at a time, just like everybody else does. So how did you become uh, an internationally recognized center of excellence? I guess we fooled a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> All right. Clearly, I'm not, I'm not digging a dry well on that one. Um, so you've now uh, uh, continued your, uh, uh, your research, um, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, have become uh, a very significant uh, research administrator. Um, what, what do you see as similar about the challenges at the University of Alberta as uh, vice president for research with the sorts of challenges that you had at, at Vito? Well, I think it, as, it doesn't even have to be at Vito, but any successful researcher uh, has to stimulate the team around him or her and make them all feel that uh, they're really part of something. Mm. So we did that at Vito, which is what made it successful. We have to, we're doing it at the University of Alberta again. Uh, I mean, we do things, I mean, one, at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm an expert in uh, oil sands and getting people excited about working together as a team either with other universities in Canada or with international colleagues and providing a vision and how can we do this. And I've never been accused of not dreaming big. So, I mean, this is the, uh, that's probably one of my flaws. Uh, and so you get these people to get passionate about something and buy in and make them think it is their idea. Because, you know, if you say, we're going to do this. They said, okay, go ahead and do it. You want them to say, this is what we can do. How can you help me? Mm. And that's, so really, I'm a, in fact, I'm a facility. In fact, some people say, oh, you got such a great job. Oh, you got such a terrible. I said, I got the best job in the world or I got the worst job in the world. I think it's the best job in the world. If it would be the worst job if you felt that you had to tell people what to do, because they will never do it. But I have the best job because I can create an environment that facilitates what they want to do, and they can accomplish tremendous things that I couldn't even dream of. So it is, this, whether it's in, in a large university uh, managing $500 million of research funding, uh, in social sciences, humanities, uh, uh, law, ethics, you name it, to engineering, to, to health, uh, doesn't really matter. Um, this is a challenge that uh, I personally know nothing about, uh, and absolutely no experience at all. Waking up in the morning, trying to uh, put your uh, pants on one leg at a time. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Babiak, uh, for uh, keeping me firmly rooted. Uh, um, your son is uh, uh, followed in your foot footsteps. What, uh, what, what compelled him? Do you think to to take up this as a career? He was here recently, uh, giving us a talk with South African and uh, and Kenyan uh, colleagues uh, from agricultural research institutes uh, uh, in both those countries uh, on uh, virology and bioinformatics. I guess I didn't spend enough time at home <laughs> to warp his mind. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope you'll permit us to uh, turn to the audience and uh, ask them uh, for some questions. Um, we have microphones um, here and here. So please uh, come to the microphone and tell us who you are. Uh, and um, perhaps we'll take uh, uh, a couple of questions at a time. Yeah. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mark Farron, I'm a, a demographer consultant. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Babiuk for the presentation. And um, a lot of the um, 
points raised, uh, especially towards the end when you refer to uh, producing healthier, more prosperous people through this long process. I just raised the question in my own mind, that balance between you mentioned bi biotechnological um, uh, approach and the social engineering and finding the balance between the two. And uh, it really sounds that you're almost on the cusp of making really important contributions so that really we could grow more food, have it better distributed, people would be, have access to more. The only sort of flashing yellow light I see in all of this is if we're really going to be that successful, how do we avoid some of the imbalances in a country like Brazil that I've been visiting for about 35 years? and I believe now has the world's largest uh, beef livestock uh, herd, if I understand correctly. And uh, I've noticed in the last 15, 20 years of Brazilian prosperity and greater production about everything, that people are getting much and much bigger than they used to be. They used to eat meat once a week. and uh, Many people are now, they're maybe eating it every day, maybe more than once every day. Obviously, this is not the only part of change. There's also the electronic tethered sedentarity society, urbanization, etc., etc. But it seems to me that one needs kind of like a, a partner for that social engineering to make people ready for the new challenges that may actually be not as healthy or not as prosperous as they thought they would be in the first place. So it's really a kind of a plea for finding a challenge in those two great, I think, uh, promising in these innovations. Thank you very much. Um. Seeing another question right at yeah, the moment. Oh, there we are. Angela. Hi, Dr. Babiak. I'm Angela Prokopiak with IDRC. And I just wanted to know more about the dynamics of working with the team in the developing world and what you've learned from that and what that team is contributing to your work. Thanks. Okay, I can uh, answer the, uh, or try to answer the first one. Uh, that is a very complicated and complex series of questions and issues. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult, even, even in Canada, where supposedly we have access to all of the knowledge, etc. But preventative medicine, and I pr say, pre in fact, I'm a perfect example. I went to do my physical the other day, and he said, uh, well, do you... Uh, drink alcohol? And I said, very rarely. He uh, said, do you drink coffee caffeinated? I said, very rarely. And he said, and I hope you don't give me the very rarely. The next question, do you exercise regularly? And I said, unfortunately, very rarely. <laughs> so, I mean, it is, it is a societal issue, and I don't know how we, and that's preventative medicine. I mean, if we did that, there's a billion people that are overweight, as, as I indicated. How do we educate people that there's a balance and I do not have, I'm not a social scientist, I don't know how to be able to do that, but we just need to continue hammering the things home that uh, there's more to just eating. Uh, and as you said, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, I mean, in Brazil and in Africa, I mean, people uh, used to have to walk. Now they can do it by their cell phone. They don't have to go to the bank anymore. In fact, this is the part that was interesting to me. Uh, you know, we are so backward in this, this technology. I mean, five years ago in Nairobi, you could pay at the local grocery store with your cell phone. And of course, they didn't have to go to the bank, walk back, back and forth. They can do that. I mean, so yes, technology is a savior, as I said, but it also has a lot of challenges. So, Angela, the question about uh, team dynamics. I mean, this is always a, a interesting challenge. Uh, there are, uh, I get frustrated. I used to have hair before, but I don't anymore. Now I pulled it all out. Is You want a progress report. Well, oh, sorry. I think I'm going to go for a holiday for the next two weeks. No, 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 no. I need a progress report. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there are some of these challenges that are, are there uh, that need to be uh, developed. It's, it's, there are different cultures. We have to accept the, the different cultures. Uh, uh, and you have to have patience and you just go with the flow. Um, I learned patience. You asked what I learned? I learned patience. 
clearly, uh, we can think about uh, um, the use of advertising and marketing, uh, not just to change uh, people's sedentary behavior uh, here in uh, Canada, but uh, we can uh, work on changing the nature of advertising and marketing uh, of, of foods and exercise uh, in many places in the world, in the Indias of the world, in the Kenyas and South Africas of the world. Um, what could we do uh, to actually uh, change the perception about uh, uh, vaccines and biotechnology, do you think? Well, education is an issue, but uh, I mean, in North America and Western Europe, there is such a huge, strong anti-vaccine lobby group that it is scary, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, and they misquote or use data to uh, push their own agendas, which is unfortunate at the expense of saving large numbers of lives. For example, there was an article a couple of decades ago that suggested that there might be a link between autism and vaccination. That has been withdrawn it's been we've spent millions of dollars disproving it but the issue is don't confuse me the facts this is what i want to believe and you cannot change their mindset because that's what they want to do so that's really where we need to engage the individuals that have the skills in the social sciences to be able to really position it in a way and we have not done that well no. and who does it because if Big Pharma does it, there's a vested interest in it. Yep. If there is uh, governments do it, well, governments are trying to push something down our... To push our their throats. own industry. Exactly. Uh, if academics do it, you know, we all have a vested interest. So I don't know who can do it and have the credibility. But that's the issue, uh, is uh, how do we... and. As I said, vaccination has been most cost-effective. In fact, vaccines have probably been too good, and people have not seen polio. People have not seen, well, whooping cough. Now they're starting to come back. Yeah. But people say, why should I uh, immunize against whooping cough? That's not a problem. Well, it is a problem. If you don't polio. vaccinize your child and my child's in your school, it's a problem for me. Correct. Well, and then there's this mindset. I was at an anti-vaccine lobby evangelical meeting. I'll call it that, <laughs> okay. because it was, I mean, the person was a evangelist. I mean, they had, and the people sitting in the audience were, oh, you like Billy Graham says, will you come forward? And they, they would, you know, they would have holding their little kids. But, you know, then I said, well, the fact is, I've heard of herd immunity. So if 70% of you get immunized, I don't have to. And I said, that's a pretty selfish approach that, you know, you, you're going to sacrifice your kid, maybe herd immunity requires 90%. How do you know? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, these are the issues that you, you, I don't know how you get around that. So, I mean, I really am an evangelist for vaccination because I think that these, we have lost the, the debate to the anti-vaccine lobby group. No. We have a question uh, from the web. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned the involvement of large pharma in taking a concept stage vaccine to market. As you know well, this does not happen very often in Canada. Would you recommend that Canadian government step in more to help the technologies developed in Canada to accelerate the path to commercialization and thus get more large pharma uh, to come here from uh, Rajan uh, George? Uh, I mean, that's a very interesting <coughs> concept and. I mean, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, we, I don't want the government to, or, or industries to sort of say, well, now all of a sudden, uh, I'm not going to do something unless there's subsidies, et cetera. But we have to somehow encourage and create the tax system or some other system that will, and I mean, there are some companies in Canada that have received funding from uh, the federal government to mm -hmm. help develop facilities. And I think those are the approaches that we have already existing. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not sure that you would sort of want to, I mean, it depends how you subsidize it. It's, it's to encourage that the, there's co-investment yeah. between the, the company and the government uh, to be able to do that. 
Okay, we have another question uh, from Susan McMillan at uh, Ilri. Uh, have the donor agencies that tend to fund vaccine research lost some of their passion? Uh, has the will to conquer the world's neglected diseases been diminished in recent decades? If so, is it because we haven't made as much progress against protozoan and other diseases as we did against viral infections? Again, Susan, I'm not sure that uh, I can answer uh, how much uh, passion that uh, some of the uh, donor agencies have uh, have lost in it. I mean, I, I'm not sure that we have uh, I'll put some of the blame on ourselves, that we have actually gone to the donor agencies and, and demonstrated the, op the opportunities and potentials. Uh, so I think that we can blame somebody, but we might be able to blame ourselves as well. It's, uh, it's a two-way street communication. And of course, the person that comes to them uh, is the one that's going to, uh, you know, the old greasy wheel is the one that gets. Yeah. Uh, I mean, or clearly, donor wheel. agencies uh, did uh, de-invest yeah. in agriculture, right. given the successes of the agriculture right. in the '60s and '70s, in the '80s and '90s. Right. There was a, 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 yeah. a shortage of investment in agriculture. So, uh, but I would say that that has changed uh, in the last decade, fairly right. dramatically. And I think the issue is, yes, uh, I mean, a number of the diseases in the developing world are protozoan diseases, and those are much bigger challenges. Uh, and, I mean, you can look at the, uh, the quantity of money that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has put into malaria and other, other governments. Uh, that's a huge challenge. I mean, I would love if IDRC would give me the money that Bill Gates had to develop these four vaccines. Yeah? Four. He's only looking at one. I mean, so therefore, <laughs> I would be able to do. So I think th those are the issues. So there have been other donors have, have come in and started to look at uh, some of the uh, protozoan vaccines. But uh, I think that it behooves us to also continue to uh, advocate and demonstrate what we can do yep. by using this technology. And I think the issue is I've always had a philosophy since started early in veto, is promise less and deliver more. I think that sometimes we have been our own worst enemy. We say, oh yes, in five years time, I will solve this world's problems. Well, the protozoan diseases are much more complex than that. And uh, so I think that that's something that sometimes, uh, or and I learned that very quickly with working with Big Pharma, is uh, uh, you, uh, tell them you're going to do something, they're very milestone driven, they're very uh, deliverable driven, and if you tell them you're going to do this, and three years later, uh, you haven't uh, really... There's been some complications. They're, they're not yeah. quite there yet. Right. After a while, they, they turn off, and I think that's the issue, is we have to be realistic and say, what can be done, in what time frame can we do it, and uh, then we gain more and more credibility. Please. Excuse me. My name is John Noble. I'm a retired Canadian diplomat. So by definition, I came here not knowing anything about the subject. And I want to thank you, first of all, for, for making things so simple, using uh, analogies like scissors and uh, uh, crazy glue to explain how you, in fact, uh, change uh, genes, etc. Could you talk about the magnitude of what you're, of the amount of money which you are receiving from IDRC? You, you alluded to Bill, the Bill Gates Foundation, but what are what what are sort of are the magnitudes that we're talking about in terms of the amount of money being spent around the world in this exercise? It seems to me you've done a marvelous job, which I presume IDRC is not Bill Gates, so they can't give you that kind of money. But what what are, what are you? Where are you getting your? <laughs> where are you getting most of your money from? Guess. And how does that compare relatively to the? the overall amount of money being spent in, in, in research in these areas? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because we have a, uh, to answer your question, we're getting a couple of million dollars, a little over a couple million dollars for a 30 month period uh, for this particular project. But uh, uh, the interesting part is we have a scientific advisory board, which is a component that, that IDRC uh, requests us to have, which I think is fantastic. And we have identified international leaders uh, around the world and our first meeting when uh, IDRC was there, they sort of said, uh, I didn't pay them, they're totally independent, uh, said, you know, I mean, this is a fantastic uh, return on investment. I mean, we wouldn't even uh, start this project uh, in, uh, in our companies <clears throat> if we didn't have uh, an extra zero put at the end of it. And for a five to seven year period, he said, you're doing this 
in a very short time period. 30 months. Uh, but, I mean, we had indicated that it would be two 30-month periods if we, but again, we're no, no guarantee that the next 30 months will, uh, will be funded. I guess it's dependent on progress and, and money, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, uh, but, you know, they just sort of said this in our company would add another zero to the end for every year. So, but IDRC is, has been the, the fantastic supporter and uh, without there them. There we go. Now With, we're talking. Without, no, I mean, no, but without them, we wouldn't have not uh, done this project. I mean, it's as simple as that. Not being political. I'm not a diplomat, see. So I'm, I'm straight, straightforward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Babiak, and uh, just a great presentation, some great science going on there. I want, uh, Lauren Hepworth, and uh, I'm with Crop Life Canada, which is another way of saying I'm with the uh, big plant life science companies that develop genetically modified products in the crop sector. Um, so I want to pick up on the discussion around GMOs and where the public are at on that. And I think going back maybe to 1991, 92, Bob Church was the chair. I think you were on that mm -hmm. committee, National Biotech Advisory Committee. And, mm -hmm. and back then, this issue of where the public are going to be as these advances come forward in biotech. The government at the time embarked on a consult series of consultations. I recall n nobody would show up. I mean, it was just not on the public radar. And, you know, here we are 20 years later, uh, a, a large issue, and, and sometimes potentially having the politics because of that trumping uh, science and science advancements. So, you know, 20 years later, what, what you know, you talked about the role of social science. Um, a couple of other observations I would make around that uh, in terms of how we might address this, and like your comment on them. One is, and you referenced, referenced the government slash regulators, and I know industry has a role here, um, and I know uh, those who would raise questions about the risk have a role, but I think the voice in the middle, the arbiter, if you like, for the public interest is the regulator, and I think too often they do not stand up and they are not vocal enough, not defending products, but defending the rigor of their system uh, to the public. Uh, so often budgets get cut, communication is one of the first areas to go. So I, I would s submit that we do need to expect more from the regulators in that area, but in the re way I suggested. Secondly, um, encouraging more scientists to speak up. Uh, you know, you're one of the rare ones who somebody said you can, you can translate this stuff so the average person can understand it. My sense is in some instances there's others out there who maybe don't have those same skills, but in some instances I think they're intimidated by these, as you described them, these evangelists. They're like, I got my day job. I don't, I'm not going to go to the public meeting and fight that. So my question is how do we, how do we encourage the scientific community to, to stand up and be more vocal uh, so that there is, I guess what I would see is more balance and sometimes a debate. Thanks. Two two questions. Uh, I mean, the the regulator issue is a very good one and an interesting one. But, and I see where they are. They're between a rock and a hard place. I mean, they have to be risk averse. And unfortunately, there is no such thing in this world as zero risk. I mean, I took a risk even walking here this morning. I mean, it took a risk flying here yesterday. There's we a just, canoe in the airport. It's not that risky. No. But, but, I mean, but the issue is, and of course, if you do something, the opposition in the House is going to right away hammer the government. So, I mean, there's all of this nuanced regulatory risk issue. We're not as litigious as the U.S. is, mm. and I hope there's nobody in the U.S. that's listening to this. But that's, <laughs> right. but I mean, they're a huge lit litigious society, and it's a blame system. Blame somebody else for everything. I mean, that's the issue. So I don't know how to answer that particular question. I mean, it'd be great if the regulators said, "Okay, we're going to be uh, absolutely independent, and we're going to do what we think is important," and. The government shouldn't get themselves into trouble over what, what we're doing. You know, I mean, that's, but that's a, I said I dream big, but that's a dream that'll never, ever come. That'll be, that, that's a dreaming in technicolor, but it'll be a nightmare. Uh, so encourage other scientists. 
I mean, the issue is people go into science because they like doing the science part of it. If they would have loved the, uh, public the podium policy. and the public, they would have gone into the social sciences. And they, but even the social scientists don't get up and, and talk about it either. I mean, so I don't know how we do that uh, uh, engagement of, uh, of uh, other scientists. But we need to encourage those that can do it or are interested in doing it to, to do it. Uh, but then after a while, they say, oh, there he is again, the same guy. Same, you know, but you, you do get camps. Kalesis Juma um, this year stood up, uh, Kalesis Juma at Harvard stood up and, and uh, challenged African universities uh, to uh, be more bold in terms of thinking about agricultural innovations from African universities and for Africa's uh, own development and to uh, challenge African scientists to, to play a, a larger and more d determinant role in these sorts of debates. Um, and uh, there was a lot of resonance uh, from African academics uh, in this, uh, the sense that uh, uh, it, it isn't the time uh, that it might have been uh, uh, 30 years ago that uh, um, a Canadian and other uh, uh, debates around these issues needed to dominate uh, uh, Kenyan debates. Uh, or South African debates, that they needed to have their own debates and that African scientists really needed to play a role. Um, to us, that's a sign of uh, some very interesting movement. Uh, when we have uh, Chinese scientists saying, no, we, China wants its own uh, biotechnology industry and frankly uh, has very different views than the Europeans on this, that, that matters, that, that counts. Now, I mean, given uh, uh, the industry you're in, you may not like the Chinese position, but that's another uh, a debate altogether. Um, another question, please. Steve? Yes. Okay. Uh, message from Jean, please. Hi, my name is Naomi Shearhart, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of Ottawa. And um, Dr. Bebiak, in your talk, you mentioned the issue of drug resistance and infectious disease. Um, and I'm specifically interested in this area. And I'm wondering what type of possibilities or potentials um, are there for your technology to contribute um, to fighting drug-resistant infectious disease? Well, uh, it won't directly because, uh, I mean, the microorganisms get resistant, but where we could, if we vaccinate, then we prevent the disease from causing an infection, so therefore that prevents the uh, the person from suffering from the disease. So I think that's that's really it's an indirect way, but not directly. Microbes are extremely brilliant. Uh, you, in fact, that's why a lot of uh, major biopharmaceutical companies have have stopped their uh, drug discovery programs because the organisms are so bright that they can go and stitch in genes that make them resistant very quickly. And so you don't have a long enough time to recoup your investments. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, Donna Schultz Poey, um, CIHR retired. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, that partly responds to some of the issue about uh, f what foreign countries are doing ba by basing it in Canada. And I'd like to know what is happening about the E. coli vaccine yeah. in the sense of uh, quite often I think we get a reaction from abroad to the concept of do what I say but not necessarily what I'm doing. And I wondered where we were in getting E. coli um, vac vaccination through our cattle herds and a corollary, perhaps, of that is West Nile virus. Now, I realize that's not necessarily going to be a vaccine, but how are we helping to control that threat in our own environment? And then we can say, well, this is how we did it. Perhaps it's a model for you abroad, because as far as I know, we haven't yet got E. coli into our cattle. And another part of that question was you said that the uh, Indians were developing hepatitis B at a very low cost. 
why can't we get some of these vaccines at a very low cost in Canada? Uh, now, I know there are industries. I know it's a different situation. But I'm wondering if we don't need to look at a different structure for how to produce some of these vaccines for the world. Um, I don't know what models there are, but the model that comes to my mind, and it has an imperial overtone, so there may be a problem there, was the old London School of, of um, Tropical Medicine That's and right. Hygiene, which had a wonderful um, uh, network throughout um, the world at that point. Well, there's a lot of questions there. Uh, the uh, E. coli vaccine, again, that was uh, developed at uh, Vito uh, when I was there, uh, licensed to a company, BioNiche, uh, uh, which they actually do sell some of the vaccine. They're in the process of licensing it, if, I, if I, my information is correct, in the U.S. now as well. And it's a vaccine you vaccinate cattle uh, to prevent uh, environmental contamination because it doesn't cause any disease in cattle whatsoever. In fact, I got accused once. I was at the podium, and uh, a producer was in the audience and sort of said, yeah, you guys, just make these vaccines cost me more money because my cow doesn't get the disease, and now I have to vaccinate. There's a chance that I won't be able to sell my cow unless I have a certificate of vaccination, so now I'm going to lose $5 on every cow. Yeah. So I get taken to task for that. But I think that's, again, the societal good that you have to look at. The public good. Public good. Uh, West Nile virus. There is actually a vaccine uh, licensed uh, for in the veterinary field uh, by uh, Mariel, a company, to be able to uh, uh, immunize animals uh, against West Nile. We don't have one against humans. Again, well, I know, but you know, animals are being protected. What about people? Well, but the animal is the vector as well. So if you can immunize and prevent the animal from multiplying the uh, the virus in the environment. Uh, and again, this is, this is the problem that you always have, is it costs, uh, depending on uh, who you uh, listen to and depending what the regulatory issues, it could cost a billion dollars to license a vaccine Ooh. Uh, because of all the risks, etc. So these West Nile is almost would be considered an orphan vaccine, which the amount of sales would be Significant lower, and that's where you would come in with your government would, would would help support it because there's a good chance that you would not immunize the entire population. Uh, so no company is going to say, "Well, I'm going to invest a billion dollars to be able to uh, recoup a hundred thousand dollars, or or even a million dollars, yeah. or even a, a billion over X number of years." So that's that. It's it's all economics, yeah. and that's where I think that. The, uh, the government uh, incentives to, to help re register a, a vaccine, an orphan vaccine, and there are programs like that. The other one is uh, low-cost vaccines. In fact, the, uh, the Indian Serum Institute, uh, if I uh, am correct, actually sells more vaccine around the world than any other company. Yes. Uh, but they don't sell it in North America. So we need to be able to uh, develop the reciprocity, the regulatory, and make sure that we can do their inspections in the right way and, and it could do the vaccines. And the reason that they sell those vaccines at, at very low cost is because the government of India poured billions of dollars into rolling out its own uh, uh, programs uh, 60 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and has had an enormous payoff for Indian society. Last question. My name is Roy Atkinson. Uh, retired from the public service now, but I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Babiak years ago when he was on the Canadian Biotechnology Advisory Committee when some of those GMO uh, feuds were, uh, were going on. I think Lauren's reference to people not showing up might have been one of the meetings that I hosted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'd like to go back, if I might. I also spent uh, many years living in Africa and in Zimbabwe. And during those anti-GMO campaigns, I was shocked. I was actually appalled, to use the Globe and Mail's expression, when scientists in Zambia advised their government during a drought when people were dying of hunger that GMO wheat was poisonous, or GMO corn was poisonous, that it was offered as food aid, and the government rejected it on the grounds that the West was trying to poison their people. 
Eventually, that was resolved with better science, but the resolution required that the GMO uh, crops be ground so they couldn't be grown. And the essence of that problem was that if they planted the GMO corn, they wouldn't be able to export corn to Europe. Same thing happened in Thailand with uh, genetically modified rice that they, great supplies, sell a lot to Europe. They wouldn't be able to sell it, so they had to deny their farmers the opportunity to use these crops. So I've got to bring my question back to what the resistance. Is the problem that Africans are, in my experience with people in the developing world for whom you're developing these vaccines, might be resistant because the vaccine is genetically modified, or is it that perhaps they're afraid they won't be able to sell their products into Europe or perhaps North America if they've used a, you know, if they've used a genetic modified vaccine on their animals. Like, what is, yeah. is it, in a sense, the developing world that's, that's a, putting a cap around some of the, these uses because they won't import the products, or is it something else? I think that uh, the vaccination has a, an advantage over GMO crops in that the vaccine doesn't persist in the animal. So once you vaccinated, the immune response occurs and you can't detect whether there's, I mean, so you can't uh, do any gene sequencing to show there's a sequencing. So I think that's probably going to be less of an issue. Uh, but there are these myths uh, and it wasn't even genetically modified, but uh, we had hoped that we would be able to eliminate polio as, as a next disease after smallpox. Well, the WHO had 2006, then it went to 2009. Today is 2013, still hasn't, has been a huge outbreak. Big outbreak in Nigeria because of the fact, it's not genetically modified, because the West is now trying to sterilize our women. You know, so there's myths that, that come about. So. This is, it's like a whack-a-mole. You know, you think you got this one, and all of a sudden it comes up over here. And, and I mean, that's the problem that we have. You can never be one step ahead, because we don't think that way. I mean, we think that this is wonderful. We're, look at what we're doing for society. And then somebody comes up with some harebrained idea that you sort of say, where did that come? Why didn't I even think? Well, because you wouldn't think that way. Thank you very much, Dr. Babiuk. Thank you, Stephen. First of all, I forgot to introduce our Vice President Program at Partnerships, Dr. Stephen Megger, that did a wonderful job, job in hosting Lauren today. So uh, thank you, Stephen, for your great help over the year. Let me offer you a few uh, remarks very rapidly. First, um, I met Dr. Babiak last spring at the uh, Killian Prize Award uh, celebration at Riddle Hall. And Immediately, I detected that you can be a proeminent scientist, but you can be also an humble and normal person that put his pants every morning. And I think uh, that's quite important in the world uh, I'm operating, meeting normal people that have a normal life but are conducting extraordinary activities is always a source of great pleasure. So, Lauren, really thank you for having been available to come at IDRC from Alberta and making yourself uh, so uh, immensely available to all of our audience here and on the web. The second anecdote is that you were giving us a lesson of leadership. Bring people to think that what they are doing is their idea, think big, and you know, carry on, provide the environment for this to carry on. A few years ago, uh, it was back in 2007, 2008, we got a phone call from a journalist for a prominent show that asked me to comment on the food price crisis. And I turned around to my staff and I said, what can we say? And one of this staff says, Jean, you know, unfortunately, at the scale that we are working, we cannot say much. We have been for the last 15 years working at community base, and that's right, because it makes a change at the level of the village. 
But if you want to scale up these innovation, we will never be able because we're not working at the right scale. We're not working necessarily with the right actors and we need to shift our mind. Now, you can imagine after close to 20 years of work on community-based natural resource management, the challenge it was to change it towards the type of work that have, give us the opportunity to work with you. And that journey was a long journey internally at IDRC, but seeing you here today, telling us that it would not have been possible without IDRC to do the type of work that you're doing is reconforting for me as the president of IDRC that we made the right strategic choice at that time. But what is even better for me is that it would be impossible for us to pursue our journey if people like you and your colleagues here and abroad were not present. You are part of a long tradition in Canada of work on vaccine. We have to go back and you know, just think of Connaught Laboratory and the role they play in polio eradication in, in, in the 50s and the leadership. The work that you have been conducting through your, throughout the years. And now that you are also offering generously to researcher in other regions of the world to you know, bridge that gap, but also find solution that will be lasting and lead to better world outcome. So really, I want to thank you personally, and on behalf of IDRC, I want to thank my team here at IDRC that work on this, particularly the communication. I want to thank the technical support as well as the translation services and the webcast crew. And I want to tell you, Lauren, that you will always have a spot, a time, a place to come and talk to us again about the development of your work. This is fantastic, and thank you very much for your coming to IDRC. Thank you.